Hey, welcome to the channel. My name is Tyler. Your name is Muhammad? Muhammad is the most commonly used name on Earth. Today we're going to look at how to quickly and efficiently render some of our sketches. Now there are tons of ways to do this. This is just one method, but I do like it because it gives you a lot of control, especially if you need to make changes later on. I'll also try to include some notes on how you can vary this method to better suit your needs or emulate different artists that you might like. So we're not going to get super into the weeds, but as a brief overview of how to render, I like to use Marco Bucci's six value method, I think is what he calls it. But basically you've got three values in the lights and three values on the shadow side, and they never really touch. So all of your lights are lighter than your darks and all of your shadows are darker than your lights. Makes sense. So first we're going to start with the core shadow, which is basically just your shadow. And it goes from the terminator and encapsulates all the shadow sides. So you can see in the little side view here, the rays of light from the sun are basically parallel because we're so far from the sun that the directional light just becomes parallel. So if the sun is shooting down on the sphere, you can see that at the midpoint here where the ball is widest, below that point, the sun can't reach anything. So light is not getting there. That line is the terminator. With local light, it's the same thing, but we get directional light, which makes the terminator closer. That's assuming the light is pretty close. If it's further away, obviously that direction is going to change. So on our sphere, our terminator is somewhere around here. All of this is shadow. Next, we get ambient occlusion. Ambient occlusion essentially appears wherever there's folds or creases or corners. What happens there is light bounces around from object to object. So if light's bouncing around, it loses power the further it goes and eventually it doesn't really reach anymore. So like I said, things like creases, corners, tight areas tend to get ambient occlusion. Next comes our bounce light. So bounce light is the lightest value in our shadow side. It's essentially lightening up the shadows, but it still never gets as bright as our light side. So what happens with bounce light is light will come down, bounce off, say the surface of whatever surface this is and bounce up into the shadow side. And that's where our bounce light comes from. Next going into the light, we've got our passive highlight, which is essentially just the light side. I tend to think of, the passive highlight is just like the light in general, in a general sense. And our core shadow is just the general shadow. And then we've got our active highlight. I'm not going to get too into the physics, but basically the reason they call it an active highlight is it's a reflection of the actual light source on the object. So it's our point of view bouncing off the ball towards the light. So if we walk around, this active highlight will actually move along with us because we're changing the incident angle of the reflection. Active highlights can be more airbrushy like this if it's a more matte finish, or you can get a really sharp reflection of the light if it's more of like a gloss finish, like a billiard ball. And that leaves us with the midtone. What's the midtone? It's essentially just a band that's right at the terminator, but on the light side where our active highlight doesn't really hit, but it's still in the light side. Planes that are facing the light more directly will create more of a highlight. So if the light's coming down this way, our highlight is more perpendicular to the light. So it bounces it more strongly, whereas the midtone won't bounce it quite as much because the angle is not as perpendicular. As you'll see in a little bit, I tend not to actively really paint the midtone. I tend to leave that as the local color of the object, but that's just the way that I like to handle it. So when I'm rendering, say, a prop, I like to actually create a different layer for each one of these lights and shadows. And that allows me to focus on only one thing at a time. It makes my life easier. And then I also create a separate layer for every individual color I've got. And the reason I do that is because between all the different colors and all of the different lights and shadows, I can select absolutely anything easily and it makes changes super easy to do. So on the sphere, you can see I've got a silhouette, which is basically my midtone because I don't actively paint in the midtone. Then I've got my shadow on one layer, ambient occlusion on another layer, bounce light, and then I've got my passive light and my active highlight. And again, the midtone is really just in the silhouette or the base color. So once I've got my sketch done, the first thing that I do is fill in the silhouette. You can just paint this in however you want. Personally, I like using the lasso tool. There's two types of lasso tools. There's the drawing one, and then there's the polygon one which creates hard lines. But in case you didn't know this, the polygon tool, once it's activated, if you hold alt, it actually becomes the drawing one. So you can go back and forth however you want. So I choose one when you could have both. The only thing you have to watch out for is alt is also 
negative. If I press it before drawing, you can see that I get a little minus there and that will subtract from my selection where shift adds to it. So you have to click first to sort of activate the lasso tool and then you can hold alt. You just have to be careful of when you're clicking buttons. Once I've got a selection, the shortcut shift F5 brings up the fill menu and I've always just got it set to the foreground color. So whatever is my foreground color, then it's set so I can just hit okay. So once I've got the selection, it's super fast. Get my selection, shift F5, fill, and we're good to go, which gives you something like that. Now, all of my other colors I have on separate layers and I use a clipping mask so that they are essentially using the silhouette as a mask. And the way that you do that is hover between the two layers, hold alt, and you'll get this little down arrow there. The reason I have them all on separate layers is because if I want to change something later and I want to select, say, just the cape, I can just control click the layer. So the way to do that is just hold control and then click the little display icon of the layer itself. Another way to do it is to have all of your flat colors on one layer, and then you can go to that layer and select the colors that you want. This acts a lot like a clown pass layer. If you're familiar with 3D, it's essentially the same thing. So this is a preference thing. I prefer to have them all on separate layers. So I've got my cape, another layer of fabric, which I call tunic. Then we've got some darker gray metal, some lighter gray metal, tubing, and some of the plates. Just another color there to change up some of the metal. I've got my helmet my smoke color, and then I've got a couple layers of rust as well. So those are my flat colors. I tend to like to do this flat first, and that just allows me to pick out my color palette. You can see this piece from Artist GXY on ArtStation, how they've got their color palette on the side here. That's essentially what I'm doing. I'm planning that out first before worrying about adding light and shadow. So once we've got that, let's add a shadow pass. Now I did this with a hue saturation layer, and as you can see, I basically just brought the lightness down. So what I did there was click the little half and half circle here, go hue saturation, and then I just brought the lightness down somewhere. We can change it later. Because it's all white, it's applying it to the whole thing. But if we click on the mask itself, so the white part, hit control I will invert it to black and now it's nowhere. And then you can paint with white in. So you just paint in the shadows, much like what we did with the sphere. So that's my first shadow layer, which is basically just like my core shadows. If you prefer, you can also do this with a multiply layer. And so normal, it looks something like this, but because I've got it on multiply, it becomes my shadow layer. So whether you wanna do this with a levels adjustment layer, a hue saturation adjustment layer, or a multiply layer, it's totally up to you, but the idea is your core shadows are on one layer. Now we do the exact same thing for ambient occlusion for areas that we need to be a little bit darker. Next I do a light layer, which in this case, I just did a hue saturation layer yet again, but this time I went up with the value. And much like the shadows, with the highlights, I used the hue saturation layer, but if you would prefer to use like a color dodge layer or a light layer or something like that, go for it. And here I start going off script a little bit. Because I'm going for more of a cell shaded look here, I'm not super concerned with matching all six of those values that we saw with the sphere. I'm basically just wanting to separate some shadows and some lights. So I've also thrown on another hue saturation layer that is sort of a global light that's basically just going from the top down. You can see I'm adding more light to the top of it. And that's really just to draw more attention to the head of the figure. From here, we can basically just add anything that we think it needs. So then I added a color balance layer, which just makes the lights a little bit warmer and the shadows a little bit cooler. So that's really all there is to it. Now that I've got everything on separate layers, if I wanted to change anything, I can do it very quickly. So if we want to change the color of the cape, I just go to my cape layer, hit control U for hue saturation, and I can just make it any color I want. Because the shadows and light are just either hue saturation layers or multiply, dodge, that kind of thing, they will affect any color that's below it. This also makes multiple color variations super quick and easy to do. These variations here only took me a couple of minutes to do. Now here's the real power. Because we've got all of our colors on a different layer and all of our shadows and lights on a different layer, we can select absolutely anything. I'll give you an example. This yellow cape here, because of the hue saturation layer, the shadows get a little bit muddy. It's kind of dark and uninteresting. How do I change just the shadow on just the cape? Well, we've got all these layers that we can make different selections for. We know we want to affect the cape, so let's select that first. So if I control click the little icon of the layer, I know I've got my cape. So now that I've got my cape selection, I'll go 
I'll create a hue saturation layer and I'm affecting the whole cape, but I want just the shadows. That's okay, now that the layer is affecting the cape, let's go and grab just the shadows. If we control click the shadow layer and then shift control click the ambient occlusion layer because we want that as well. Now I've got all of those. So because currently we have the whole cape selected, I essentially want to eliminate anything that is not shadow from the new hue saturation layer. So I've got my shadow selected, and if I press Control shift i it will inverse that selection, the opposite of the shadow selected, which is the light. Now that I've got that, I go to my new hue saturation layer, and I'm going to subtract or fill with black. Now what I'm left with is a new hue saturation layer, which is just the shadow in just the cape. Now I can change just the shadow to whatever I want. So if we go something a little bit more red maybe, and then I can turn that layer on and off. See that, that's what it was, and that's what it is now. Now some of you might have caught this, but if I crank the lightness, you can see that it's actually going outside of my silhouette. And that's because of this new hue saturation layer I don't have set as a clipping path. No problem. Another thing we can do is because we've got the whole silhouette, I can control click the silhouette layer, shift control I to inverse that. So now I've selected everything that is not the silhouette and I subtract that from my hue saturation layer. And now that's gone. So if I crank it, you can see it's only affecting the cape now. So hopefully that wasn't too confusing. The thing I wanna drive home here is by having the shadows on a separate layer, you can select just the shadows or you can inverse that selection and grab everything in the light. You can also select all of the individual colors and by doing different combinations of those selections, you can grab any one color in either the light or shadow. So really you can select absolutely anything really easily to make these kinds of changes. Now obviously with a cell shaded look like this, you can keep it pretty simple. If you wanted to, you could get away with just base colors, one shadow, one light, and that's really it. But you can take the same idea further and get a little bit more painterly with it. Here's a page of potions I was messing around with, and they're a little bit more painterly, but the process is exactly the same. Okay, let's look at the holy water. So the base color I use for the silhouette is for the glass specifically, and you can see that I did add some painterly strokes. And I'm starting to hint at light a little bit here, but really I'm going to take care of that later with adjustment layers. But the point here is that you can add any value shifts or even color shifts that you want on that base color layer, and it's still a selectable layer. And again, even in the water, I'm starting to hint at light a little bit, but I'm more just worried about color shifts. And then Bounce Light gets its own layer. With the robot dude, I actually didn't even use Bounce Light. So earlier I mentioned a few different ways in which we can tweak this process. So let's take a look at some other examples. So I think Mark Brunet is a good example. His process is fairly similar to this. He does all of his shadows and ambient occlusion on a multiply layer first. So this is sort of his rendering pass, and this is where he's tackling the light and shadow. Next, he sorts out his colors, and Mark likes to use gradient maps, which is a super quick and easy way to do your color. But the process is basically the same. He's got each element on a different layer, so he's got a gradient map for his skin, a separate gradient map for clothing, accessories, that kind of stuff all gets its own layer. Next, we can look at Aaron Blaze. He also builds up his shadow and light with multiple layers, so he'll add a multiply layer for his core shadows, or main shadows, and then he'll add another multiply layer for ambient occlusion where those shadows need to get darker. And then he'll slowly add layers of light. I believe he just paints in the light with lighter and lighter colors, but he's still building it up on multiple layers. All right, so there's some ideas on how you can quickly and efficiently render your sketches. Again, there are tons of different ways to do this. So if you've got a different method that you prefer, let me know in the comments. Thanks so much for watching. Like, subscribe, and all of that stuff. As always, if you've got questions or ideas for future content that you'd like to see me cover, let me know in the comments. Be good to one another, and I'll see you next time. Okay, bye.